Welcome back to the Basic for Unreal. The last time we had a big, big info dump about a bunch of different things about the interface for Unreal. Today we're going to go into some actual technical stuff, that being what actors are, how they work, and how you can make your own. So we've got a actor blueprint over here that's been pre-made by the template that we're using. And this is a character. So we can just drag that in and now it exists within our world. And as you can see, my performance is kind of bad. Ah, there we go, that's much better. Uh, it exists in our world now. So that's how we put things into the world. But how exactly do we make our own? Well, let's go back to our content folder here, up top. And we can just right click in our content drawer. Also, if you're wondering how I'm pulling up the content drawer like this without clicking on it, if you press Ctrl and space, it just automatically pulls it up no matter where you are in the engine. We can right click in our content drawer and there we can add a bunch of different kinds of assets. And we'll eventually go over the most important ones of these, but for now a blueprint class is what we want to make. And when we make a blueprint class, you can see we have a parent class that we need to pick. And this is where things get a little bit complicated, so stick with me. Because up top here we've got the actor, the pawn, and the character. These three form a hierarchy. And what I mean with that is that the actor, every object that you put inside your world is going to be a actor. Meaning that they have all of the functionality that is pre-existing within the actor class, as it's called. That is things like having positional data, like the transform, we discussed before. It has the capability to check and deal with collision and physics if you wanted to. It has the capability of holding components, which you can see on the bottom here, an actor component or a scene component, which we'll get into in a moment. And it has some other things like a event called begin play, which will execute code as soon as the actor is put into the world. An event called tick, which will run every frame that the actor exists in the world. That's all coming from the base class named actor. When we click on this, we get a new blueprint class based on that. So let's call this test actor. And generally it's good to prefix this by putting BP underscore in front of it. By the way, at a glance, we can see, oh, this is a blueprint. And if we open it up, we now get a window here, which we can dock up there and we have our basic actor here. Now, it's important to note that, and this is where things get a little confusing, specifically that this blueprint itself is not really just an actor anymore. This is now a BP underscore test actor, meaning that it has all the functionality that the actor class itself has, but we can build on top of that. We can give it extra data, we can give it extra scripts, and that builds on top of what Actor already does. If we now go back and make another Blueprint class, that is exactly what a pawn does. A pawn is a pre-existing extension of an Actor, and this relationship is what we call a parent-child relationship. So Actor is the parent to the pawn, meaning that a pawn takes all the functionality that the actor has and then adds its own functionality on top of that. And here you can see what that is. A pawn is an actor that can be possessed and receive inputs from a controller. That can be either the player controller or a AI controller. Then we have the character, which is a child of the pawn. So the pawn is the parent to the character, which by inheritance also means that the actor is a parent, you could call it a grandparent if you wanted to, I suppose, to the character. And the character is simply a pawn that includes the ability to walk around, specifically meant for humanoid characters. And if we make a pawn real quick, and we call that BP test pawn, we will see that if we compare the right hand side here on the details panel to the test actor, we see that there's a couple of new different things, and that is use the controller rotation, use the controller yaw, and roll, and can affect next generation, auto-possess player, auto-possess AI, and AI controller class. And then we've got some input stuff here 
as well. That is what the pawn adds on top of what the actor already was capable of. Now, let's also make a character, just to show you that that extends that even more. BP test character. I also know that these all have unique icons to them. The moment you start adding your own meshes to these, that's what will get displayed instead. But it's nice to have a visual reference of what kind of actors we're working with, whether it be a normal actor, a pawn, or a character. And when we open up the character, you'll definitely see that this has quite a bit more going for it, because this now has a capsule component, which is used for collision. It has an arrow component, which usually isn't really used for any specific functionality purposes, but it's nice to be able to have a reference to what the actual like forward-facing direction of your character will be. And it already has a mesh put into it as well. So we can select a skeletal mesh asset, which is something like this, and we can pull that down and rotate it and maybe even scale it down ever so slightly. I've got the scaling still set to being way too much. So scale it down ever so slightly. And that is basically how we set up a character. Then you see this little line over here before we go to the character movement component. And this is the component that has been added that will allow this character to move around in a pre-made way for us. And it's, it's a really powerful tool to be able to use because this allows you to set the gravity scale on an individual basis per actor the maximum acceleration, uh, a lot of things for walking, settings for jumping and falling. It's even got pre-built swimming and flying controls in it as well. And now that I'm showing off this component, I think it's a good time to start talking about some other components. So let's close out the character and the pawn because I'm just going to show this in the normal actor. Because the normal actor by itself doesn't really do much. The only thing a actor does without any extension to it is existing. It doesn't have any collision. It just has the capability to detect and calculate collision. It doesn't have any other sort of functionality because we're going to need to add that through adding either scripts through the event graph, which we'll get into in the next part, or components. And the components together is what is your actor in total. So let's try to add a component here. And you can see there's a bunch of different options that we can add in here. But for the time being, let's go for a static mesh. A static mesh is a mesh, so a 3D object, that's not been animated. And when we add that, we can see it gets added into the hierarchy here. And we can call it something, let's just call it mesh. Having that selected on the right hand side in the details panel, we can see uh, the static mesh here which will allow us to pick one of the static meshes that this project holds, which is quite a few of them. So let's go for, I don't know, the cone. That seems kind of fun. And we can move that around and we can scale that up a little bit if we wanted to. And we can save that and compile. If we then go back into our test map here, we can see that our blueprint class now has an image of the thing that we put in it. And we can drag that in and we have the cone. The cone still doesn't do anything, but we can now see we added the components, we gave it a value for the static mesh, and now we can put that into our world. It's worth noting that you can put static meshes directly into the world as well, but then they won't have any functionality or any sub-components. And that's the brilliant thing that we can do here, because we can add another component. Let's say we want to add a sphere component, on top of this, right? And as you can see, it's in a sub menu almost, we can collapse this, of the mesh, meaning that this is now a child of the mesh. So just as the classes themselves have child's parent relationships, so do components in the hierarchy. But it means something slightly differently in practice, because what this does is when I move this mesh, it moves all of its children around with it. And if I rotate this, the children maintain the same relative position to its parents, which can be a very useful thing to be able to do. 
And the most wonderful thing now is, if we put this into the world, we can see it immediately has the new component that we added to it as well. So let's add another component. Let's add a cube. Why not? And that cube is going to not be a child, right? Just to show you the difference here. So if we just drag this up to the default scene root, we can say uh, attach. Or we could have made it the new root as well, which is the pivot point of this actor. And we can move this around now. And we'll see, moving this set of meshes around, the cube doesn't move with it. The best part, though, is we now added a cube, and that immediately is visible in the actor that we already previously placed in the world, which is fantastic. That then gets us into the two different kinds of components that we have. Because you might recall, when we made this blueprint class here, we could see a player controller and a game mode base as well. We're not going to get into that for the time being, because that makes things overly complicated. But we had an actor component and a scene component. And let's just read what it says. An actor component is a reusable component that can be added to any actor. Well, it's not very informative, is it? But a scene component is a component that has a scene transform and can be attached to other scene components. So everything we see here, this cube, this mesh, and this sphere, these are all scene components because they have a physical location inside the world. A actor component, on the other hand, doesn't have a physical location. It's just some bit of data or some bit of script that's attached to an actor that doesn't need any place in the world. So it doesn't need to have a collision, it doesn't need to have a location, it's just only information. And one of the scene components that is very nice and useful to be able to use is one called the rotating movement. And you will note that we can't attach this rotating movement to any of our scene components because it itself isn't a scene component. If we select a cube, we see it has a transform. If we select a rotating movement, it does not, because it doesn't exist in the world. All it does is tell these other components that it needs to do something. That being, it's going to make the default scene root rotate. So if we now run the game, we'll be able to see that this thing rotates, because it has a rotator component. So if you have a character that needs to have something like a stats component, Right? That's something that is very useful for, where it would hold the information about its max HP and its current HP and its attack value and its defense value, maybe a magic value, all those different kind of things. Those you could put on a actor component, because it's just information that doesn't concern itself with any physical location inside the world. Something like an inventory as well would be an actor component. And with the mix of the scene components, which exist in the world itself, and the more abstract actor components, you can mix and match to create whatever actors you want. And that is the basics of how actors work in Unreal Engine. So we've got actors, which is literally any object in your game, is a child of the actor class. Then anything that can move on its own volition, that being AI or a player, is going to be a pawn. Because a pawn is an actor which just has the ability to get input controls and do something with them. If it needs to be a semi-humanoid, at least, character that needs to be able to walk around and things like that, you're going to want to make a character, which is a specialized version of a pawn. So again, we've got an actor which has a child, which is the pawn, which is a child that is the character, and there you then create children of your own. And that you can infinitely extend. So let's say we make our test character here. This test character could very well have some functionality that is shared by both the player and the enemy AI. So what we could do is we could add that functionality to this, and then when we right-click this, we can create child blueprint class, in which case this would be test character player. And if we make another child blueprint class of that, we could have a test character enemy. And now anything we put into this test character will also be present 
in both of these children. And then we only have to make the thing that makes these different inside of the children, rather than having to copy over all the functionality from the test character itself. This again is a lot of very dense information about how the engine and the workflow is structured. And just like in the last part, I definitely do not expect you to internalize all of this information right away. So if you're still a little bit confused as to how this actually works, don't worry, I fully expect you to be. As we go along and we actually put all of this information into practice, you can always come back to this video to remind yourself of how exactly things work. And over time, things will click and sink in and you will start to understand what all of this mumbo jumbo that I've just spouted at you for the past however many minutes actually means. Next time, we're going to go into one of our own actors and we're going to open this events graph in which we'll be using these events to make a little simple script to get us into actually programming our game. And a very big thank you to all of my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page.